This week, we're going cryptocurrency crazy. We'll see how to mine Bitcoin in a warehouse of thousands of machines or in your kitchen on your blender. Welcome to Iceland, one of the strangest places I've ever been. It is ice cold and boiling hot. Now, that does come with advantages. The volcanic activity that formed the island millions of years ago means it has access to very cheap geothermal electricity. And all that cold air? Well, that can be used as a free cooling system. So, cheap electricity and cold air. In short, the perfect place to put a load of computers. Oh, wow! <laughs> Every single one of these is a home computer. That's all it is. That is a desktop computer. And there are thousands of them. These computers are working flat out. Without a cooling system, their processors would overheat in a matter of minutes. So in the main area, I'd say the air temperature is about 20 degrees or so, but behind the racks of computers here, it's much colder, probably about five. And that's not because you have expensive air chillers. Remember, we're in a cold climate, so all we have are holes in the external wall. The air comes in, all the dust and humidity is caught by these filters, and then it just washes over the computers and up and out through the giant fans in the roof. So. What is it that these computers are doing that warrants all this noise, this heat, and this power? Well, they are creating or mining cryptocurrency. Yep, cryptocurrency, the new family of virtual currencies that its enthusiasts say will replace pounds, euros, dollars, and all the other traditional currencies in the coming years. That claim is, however, still a very live debate, with cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ether and Ripple fluctuating wildly in their exchange rates. The more mining computers you own, the more money you make. And that incentive has led to massive hordes of machines like this one popping up all around the world. Mining is cheaper if you don't have to pay for the cooling, but it's cheaper still if you don't have to pay for the computers you use at all. A fact that's led criminals to think of new ways to try and make a quick crypto buck. Here's Dan Simmons. It's a crime that's fast becoming the hacker's favorite. And the impact often goes unseen. This house looks like your computer after it's been hijacked. Everything may look fine from the outside, but inside, resources have been ransacked. To add insults to injury, your electricity bill is about to go up as you pay to power a machine that's now working hard for the criminals. A friend of mine got in touch with me on the Sunday morning and said, I've just been to the Information Commissioner's Office website, where the ICO here in the UK, our data protection body of the government, and he said, my antivirus programme has thrown up this warning on the screen. And he said, this is a government website. Can it have a virus on it? So what we discovered was originally that the ICO website was running a crypto miner, so your, your browser would be hijacked to mine cryptocurrencies for the hackers. After some investigation, what we found was that a third party supplier that provides them with software had been breached and they'd included the crypto miner in that. 
A third-party app used by the ICO and thousands of other websites had been compromised. The malware told visitors' computers to start mining cryptocurrencies for the bad guys. And you can see before my system was doing one or two different things and now the miner is running. The miner is taking 100% of my CPU on this device and using it to mine cryptocurrencies. Uh, you can configure a crypto miner in how much of the computer's power it will use. Now if you're greedy and you take 100%, then someone's computer or phone or tablet will slow down and you will notice that when you try to do things it's not responsive, it hangs. Uh, what they've done in this case is they'd only configured it to use up to 60% of the power of the device. So it would use a lot of it. So again, the average user may never have known that it was there and that it was running. Scott showed me how they could have stolen visitors' data. So why didn't they? So what I've set up here is something that the attackers could have done. I've given myself the same level of access they did. And you'll notice that the Information Commissioner's Office website has a username and password field. Uh, so if you just go ahead and type something into that field, and already, if you look at the information being sent to my oh device my here. Oh my god. This is coming up on there straight away. As you type, that is sent in real time to me. And the attackers, in this instance, could have done this. Absolutely. They just chose not to. Why? Easy money. You know, attackers will take the low-hanging fruit, they put the crypto miner onto this website and they walk away. The ICO told us no personal data was compromised. Third-party applications were swiftly reviewed and their systems patched. And that they're also exploring new ways of protecting their systems. Security firms are reporting hackers making millions of dollars. It's called cryptojacking. It's on the rise. And the gangs that do it aren't only eyeing up a Lambo. Tesla is one of the higher profile victims. Redlock called them to say their cloud server, provided by Amazon Web Services, had been compromised. The attacker obviously was doing crypto mining, but what we found out was this server was also exposing the other secrets to the Tesla's environment. These secrets had access to some engineering uh, test cars, telemetry data. The crims didn't want secrets, they wanted resources. And now most things are connected to the net, there could be some targets you've not thought of. This viewer's smart TV isn't quite clever enough to stop a crypto miner that's put its processors into top gear. Just look at the heat signature from the TV fire stick that isn't infected to one that is. The cyber criminals can get onto any other device in your household, for example, into a microwave or even into a smart blender if it's smart enough. It just depends on the intentions of cyber criminals and how good the device is for mining. Thankfully, at the moment, our connected kitchens don't have quite the processor power the hackers are looking for. I know what you're thinking. Forget the criminals. Is it worth us orchestrating our own devices to start crypto mining to increase our own bank accounts? Or is it just not worth the effort? While even your mobile can mine for cryptocurrencies, if you want to make more than a few pennies, you'll need to buy one of the dozens of these miners with processors specifically designed for the job. So how do the maths add up? Well, we've got ourselves one of the latest crypto miners, but that's not the only cost in this business. We've got to pay for the electricity to run it 24 seven, which in a typical US city might cost us about $200 a month. So how fast can it mine cryptocurrency? Well, that partly depends on how many people join in the game, because the more total computing power doing this, the lower our return will be. But recent estimates suggest about one Bitcoin a year. So it all boils down to how much a crypto coin is worth. Now, look at the Bitcoin rate back in December. And now in April, that price has tumbled and our costs are rising. 
Some reports now suggest that you'd find it difficult to make a profit inside of a year. Unless, of course, you're using someone else's kit. Hello and welcome to The Week in Tech. It was the week that WhatsApp raised its minimum age for users from 13 to 16 in the EU, Facebook asked for permission to fly experimental drones over New Mexico, and Elon Musk casually mentioned he's building a cyborg dragon via Twitter. It was also the week that Samsung released six new TV shows filmed exclusively in virtual reality. They include Robots, a comedy about two British robots joining a futuristic New York Police Department. Researchers at NVIDIA demonstrated a new way to reconstruct photographs using deep learning algorithms. The software predicts what a damaged photo should look like and fix corrupted pixels. Robots are taking over more jobs this week. Pepper the Robot started a prestigious post at the Smithsonian in Washington, and a robot helping patients rehabilitate by playing a game of tic-tac-toe with cups came to life in Israel. And finally, we heard evil artificial intelligence could start a nuclear war by the year 2040. This is according to a report from the RAND Corporation think tank. It says advances in AI could challenge the basic rules of nuclear deterrence and lead to catastrophic miscalculations. But on the flip side, it says with the right amount of global cooperation, AI could actually make us safer. Phew. As the parent of a five-year-old, I can tell you that I don't want to see my daughter glued to a smartphone or obsessed with using a tablet. But at the same time, our children do need to learn how to engage with technology. So it's no surprise that a lot of devices that aim to combine coding and creativity are becoming popular. So today, I'm going to be testing some of the latest, but seeing as I'm a little bit too old for school, I've got a few helpers here. Is everybody ready? Yay! Here at Dallow Primary School, these Year 3 students seem to be engrossed in the experience. Over here we've got the Cano Pixel Kit being tested. After a bit of coding takes place, there are lots of flashing lights. After connecting the app, kids can get coding, creating light shows or games, even using weather data or their own voices to trigger changes. The kids love the bright lights, but I do wonder how many times they'd need to use it before the novelty wore off. It gives you a more understanding of what, re what coding really is, and uh, when you're older you can become an inventor or anything uh, that has coding, it would help you. We have over here we have something which is actually called an inventor kit. How exciting is that? What are you up to here? We actually press, press this and then we press edit so we could change the picture. Then we can actually change the picture and how it looks on here. This magnetic electronic building system challenges the kids to create reactions triggered by sensors. Here, one second after moving the gyroscope, a buzzer will go off. There are even advanced functions allowing smart home integration and the invention guides do get updated so provide a variety of things to do. The set is also compatible with Lego bricks. It's good because it's kind of encouraging our brains to get a bit better to create and stuff. Well I have no idea what they're going to invent next but I'm going to leave them to it. Over here meanwhile we have a codable drone. How are you two getting on? It's good. It's going to rise up and then it's going to turn, then it's going to go forward, then it's going to turn right, then it's going to do like a shape, then it's going to rise again, then it's going to go clockwise. It's a good job you don't have to remember all of that. It's quite complicated, but you set up a sequence of movements. So once we get a little more space, I think we're going to go outside the classroom to do this. So here we've got the Stemosaur, which is a codable dinosaur. The kids had a great time constructing the Stemosaur, but it needed home Wi-Fi to be tested properly, leaving them somewhat disappointed. Once built, as well as a coding panel to program it, it can tell stories, do maths, tell jokes and more. 
testing it at home, initially it was pretty intuitive, but much like a conversation with Alexa or Google Home, it doesn't always grasp what you're talking about. Can you help me meditate? I'm not sure I understand. The company says it collects information to better the questions and answers in future, but that this is totally anonymous. And once it has been usefully used, it will be deleted with only the statistical analysis living on. All of the bits of technology do um, enable children to work on those programming and coding skills and problem solving as well at the same time. OK, so some space. Let's give it a go. Oh! That was Lara, and now we go back to cryptocurrency and to Iceland, where I've been getting a lowdown on the economics of running a giant cryptocurrency mining warehouse. Well, we started this in 2013. So what did you start with? Was it just one machine? Yeah, one machine in, the, in our bedroom. No way! Exactly. So one machine in your bedroom and now you have this? Exactly. Wow! And how many machines are here? Uh, around 20,000. 20,000? 20,000. Can you tell me roughly how many coins you make in a day? These machines are doing millions of dollars per day. They're making millions of dollars a day though? Yes. Right, okay. I mean, do you have any idea how much it costs? How much this operation costs to set up and to run? Well, I can see our electricity bill. Our electricity bill is uh, higher than 1 million euros per month. 1 million euros per month in electricity. Yes. And that's Iceland prices as well. That's Iceland price. Wow. Yes, cheap power is important for crypto miners, but they're not always welcome. Last month, in northern New York, Plattsburgh became the first U.S. town to ban Bitcoin mining. This isn't because we're Luddites, it isn't because we're afraid of cryptocurrency, it's because we recognize we have a fixed resource. Plattsburgh has provided unusually discounted electricity, about a fifth of the price of other American towns, and that's thanks to a fixed allocation of power from the Niagara hydropower plant. But the surge in usage from mines has sent prices skyrocketing, hiking up bills for residents. So the local government has imposed an 18-month moratorium, preventing new commercial crypto mines from setting up shop. We were finding that the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency users were coming and demanding so much of our power that it was forcing us to have to buy very expensive power and uh, it had a really detrimental effect on our rate payers. They use such an immense amount of power. One operator alone uses 10% of the entire quota. Mayor Reed expects other New York towns to follow suit. But crypto mining isn't always just the selfish pursuit of wealth, as Mark Chislak has been finding out. The war in Syria has raged for seven years. It's estimated that 470,000 people have died in the conflict. So the needs are huge. There are about 8 million kids that require our attention and that need urgent help. Uh, 5 million of them are still stuck in Syria. The effect of the war on the civilian population has been devastating. There are besieged places, there are hard to reach places, so we're trying our best to reach the children that are most vulnerable. Various aid agencies are trying to combat the refugee crisis caused by the war. UNICEF estimates that Syrian aid will cost $3.5 billion in 2018. With such vast sums of money required, fundraising efforts have gone into overdrive. The latest initiative plans to pay for aid using the cryptocurrency Ethereum. UNICEF in France is responsible for this unusual form of fundraising. Called Game Changers, the project is the brainchild of France's largest advertising agency, BETC. My mother used to say, uh, money don't grow on trees. But 
she was wrong because you can't do money with nothing, with just electricity and, uh, and graphic card, which is very new, a new way to donate. The plan is to use blockchain technology to mine cryptocurrency using gamers' computers. Some of the most hardcore gaming computers belong to those who play games for a living, esports competitors, professional gamers. But their fundraising efforts aren't taking place at flashy gaming events. So, it's been necessary to enlist the help of people who have just the right equipment, which is why I've come to this quiet Parisian suburb, because this house here is the unlikely location of a cryptocurrency mine. This is the training camp for one of France's most successful professional gaming teams called Gamers Origin. They play the game League of Legends. Our training is like five hours a day, usually. Sometimes we have days off and etc. but uh, we need to play at least five hours and then after we have our free time. After installing a bit of mining software, these computers' powerful GPUs or graphics processing units can begin mining the cryptocurrency. So basically we can raise money just by having our PCs on for yeah, the majority of the time. And it's when these gamers aren't playing games that their machines get to work mining, which means their computers need to be switched on pretty much all of the time. So we just do it when we don't use the computer, basically. Like when we eat, when we can sleep and stuff, we just use it, we, we make the software on. And uh, yeah, when we play, obviously, we don't use it. But some experts question the use of this technology for fundraising purposes. It's innovative in that it catches into the uh, sort of Bitcoin rise and bubble hype um, where everyone's saying Bitcoin, blockchain, cryptocurrency, and it, it gets some attention for that. The cause is excellent. Um, the th cause should thoroughly be supported, but the method of raising money is just really bad. Like, firstly, mining cryptocurrency. This means using cr cryptocurrency that uses the proof of work method, which is literally wasting money to calculate numbers and they throw numbers at the system until they win some coins. Um, it's wasteful by design. It also burns out the video cards, so it produces a huge pile of e-waste as well. I mean, it's a good cause. Everyone should just go to the site with their credit card, give them some money. Researchers at UNICEF think they might have other uses for blockchain technology beyond fundraising, though. It's estimated that 30% of aid to war zones doesn't reach its intended destination, lost to corruption in the regions. Can blockchain technology be used to help in terms of corruption? Because there is a, a lot of corruption around the distribution of aid in quite a few war-torn countries. Well, everything you do in the blockchain is public, so it's like really, really transparent. It's virtual, so people don't have to carry cash on themselves. Uh, in countries where the security is sometimes very difficult. Uh, imagine that the transaction would be like very clear uh, from the onset. You see very well who receives what at what moment, which avoids the risk of duplicating the transfers, which happens from time to time, etc, etc. The Game Changers project ended on March the 31st and generated 84 Ethereum. UNICEF cashed these in, raising 26,378 euros, which will go towards providing aid for Syria. Its creators say this is just the beginning, a beta test of the technology, before they try using it for different aid-related purposes. And that's it from a rather noisy click, as it turned out. Don't forget that we live on Twitter at BBC Click and on Facebook too, where you can find loads of extra footage of this and all of our other shoots too. Thanks for watching and we will see you soon.